This morning we're going to be looking at Psalm 51 as we continue on our series, Praying Through Life. And so, as we've been emphasizing throughout the service, as you heard in the song that we sang about Psalm 51 this morning, we're going to be talking about guilt. I remember the very first time that I felt really guilty. I had just gotten a toy from Walmart. I was probably about five years old. Uh, My family and I had gone to Walmart, I'd gotten a toy, we'd brought it home, and my parents had told me not to leave it around, to put it away when I was done playing with it, but uh, I had forgotten, I'd left it on the couch. And so my parents found it and asked, did you leave this out? Uh, And I I knew the consequences of leaving it out, right? They were going to take it away, and I didn't want that toy taken away from me, and so I said at that point in time, no. I didn't leave it out, even though the obvious question is, well, then who else did? Uh, There weren't any other five-year-olds in my house at the time. Uh, But at that point in time, I wanted the toy more than anything else, and so I lied. I lied about it. And I think that my parents could tell that something was going on. Obviously, they were smarter than me at that point in time. They knew that something was happening, and so they They kind of slowed the conversation down, looked me very clearly in the eye and said very carefully, let me ask you this again. Did you leave this out? Did you do this? Again, I could tell that they were on to me, but again, I wanted the toy, and so I said again, no, I didn't leave it out. It it wasn't me. I don't know what happened. At that moment in time, they decided, for whatever reason, that they would go along with it, that they would kind of let me bear the consequences of my words, uh, if not my actions. And so at that point in time, they they said, okay, fine, you you can keep your toy. Just remember to put it away next time. So I was happy that I had gotten to keep my toy, but there was a new emotion that came along with the happiness, and that feeling was guilt. I remember it very clearly. Uh, And since that moment in time, I've had that feeling any number of times throughout my life, times that I've let people down, uh, time that I got pulled over and got a speeding ticket, and most importantly, times that I have given in to sin. That's guilt. And I know that we all have experiences like that. All of us have our own stories about experiencing guilt, maybe for the first time or maybe even freshly on your mind as you come into the worship service today. We all know the, the feeling in our stomach that we would just term guilt. I know what it's like to feel guilty. You've done something wrong. It's guilt. And so the question for us this morning is, what are we supposed to do with that feeling? What are we supposed to do with the knowledge that we are guilty? And the answer comes to us in Psalm 51. God wants us to be driven to prayer by our feelings of guilt. And so in Psalm 51, he gives us the ABCs of how to pray through guilt. Now, this is a challenging message because we have to confront our guilt. We can't just wave it away and have it magically disappear, but it's also a tremendously comforting message because in Psalm 51, we hear about freedom from guilt, the forgiveness that God gives to us. And so here are the ABCs of praying through guilt. A, B, C. A, agree with God. B, Be broken before God, and C, cling to God's promises. With that in mind, let's turn our attention to God's most holy word as we hear him speak precise, incisive words about our situation, but ultimately words that are profoundly freeing and healing. This is Psalm 51, to the choir master, a psalm of David. When Nathan the prophet went to him after he had gone in to Bathsheba. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. According to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. Behold, 
I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, you delight in truth in the inward being, and you teach me wisdom in the secret heart. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me with a willing spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners will return to you. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, O God of my salvation, and my tongue will sing aloud of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth will declare your praise. For you will not delight in sacrifice, or I would give it. You will not be pleased with a burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit. A broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. Do good to Zion in your good pleasure. Build up the walls of Jerusalem. Then you will delight in right sacrifices, in burnt offerings, and whole burnt offerings. Then bulls will be offered on your altar. Brothers and sisters, thus far in the reading of God's holy word, the grass withers and the flower fades but the word of our God will stand forever. Let's pray. Almighty God, we're humbled as we hear this word of confession, this cry of desperation for forgiveness and grace. And we all know in our own lives the sting of guilt, the knowledge of guilt, and the burden that it is on our lives. And so I pray now, O God, that we who have already in this worship service confessed our sins and already received the assurance of our forgiveness in Christ, I pray that we would now have ears to hear and hearts to receive this message of comfort from you. Teach us to pray, O Lord, when we know that we have wronged you. Teach us to pray now through your word and comfort us according to it and its rich promises. We pray in the name of Christ. Amen. So let's start at the very beginning. What do you do immediately after you feel those initial pangs of guilt? Uh, We don't know the exact reason. Maybe you've done something wrong and someone else has called you out for it. And so you feel now that sense of guilt. Or maybe you've done something wrong and silently in your own life the Holy Spirit has convicted you of that sin. So what should you do when you experience guilt? How should you pray? Remember your ABCs. And it starts with A. A, agree with God. Agreeing with God is the pathway to healing, like we hear in the scriptures, that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. We need to agree with God. A few years ago, I started having some pretty severe knee pain in one of my knees. It would come and go and get worse and worse, and so I had to get an MRI. And when the results came back from the MRI, the doctor sat me down and gave me the hard news. I had a torn meniscus. I had a partially torn ACL. I had tendonitis and tendinosis in that knee. So that knee was not in very good shape. And it was really hard to hear, but it was vital for me to agree with his analysis so that I could get the help that I needed, and it's the same with God and our guilt. We have to agree with God about what we're experiencing, and here's God's diagnosis. Our guilt is real. There is a real God with real standards for us, and when we break those real standards, our guilt is real, and that's why David says in verse 4, against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. Now, this doesn't mean that he didn't sin against Bathsheba, that he didn't sin against Uriah or the whole army or even the whole 
people of Israel, David did sin against those people, but it means that at the end of the day, his sin ultimately counts before God. His sin, sort of, so to speak, lands at the feet of God because God is the judge. And you get that sense as we read through this psalm. It's a really interesting psalm to compare with the one that we looked at last week. Unlike Psalm 40 that we looked at last week, which uses the covenantal name of God nine times, that's the word, the Lord, in all caps, God's covenant name, in Psalm 51, David doesn't use that name at all. When he cries out to God once, he says, O Lord, using a different name for God than the covenantal name for God. And then five other times, he just simply says, O God, using the more basic name for the deity that he worships, God the King, God the Judge. David's not denying, of course, God's covenant love his covenant promises, his loving, faithful character. But here in this psalm, he is standing before the judge. He's in the courtroom of God having to deal with his very real guilt. So God's judgment is real. Our sin is real and our guilt is real. That's what God has to say. Now, our culture doesn't always agree with everything that I've just said. There's this narrative in pop culture that Christianity creates guilt. If you've talked with anyone who's left the faith or deconverted, sometimes you hear this idea coming from them. They'll say something perhaps like, you know, I stopped feeling guilty the second I left the church as if it's the church's invention of of guilt that they were feeling. But Christianity doesn't create guilt. Christianity reveals guilt. You create guilt by your own actions. And so if you have unconfessed sin, when you stand before God in the church, of course you feel guilty, because you are guilty. Your guilt is real. And deep down, I think we all know that. Just look at the way that every single human being acts. We are always on the lookout for some form of guilt alleviation. Even the person who thinks that sin is imaginary, even that person structures his or her life in ways that can alleviate guilt, whether it's giving to charity or trying to be a good citizen or always feeling the pressure to be on the right side of history. See, we are always craving justification. We're always craving someone to tell us that we are innocent, that we are okay, that we're good, because deep down we all know that we're guilty. And so the good news for us this morning is that Christianity doesn't just reveal guilt. Christianity actually removes guilt. The good news of the gospel is that our guilt is removed through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. But in order for us to get there, in order for us to experience that relief, we first need to agree with God. Our guilt is real. Also, God thinks that our guilt is destructive. There are very real consequences to breaking God's law. Like we hear in the scriptures, in this narrative, and even in this psalm, there's relational fallout, there's tremendous emotional pain that happens, but most importantly, there is tremendous spiritual damage because God cannot abide with sin. Verse 9, hide your face from my sins. Or verse 11, take not your Holy Spirit from me. Now, sometimes you might hear that verse used to suggest that believers can lose the Holy Spirit. And if you've heard that, and if you, if you are concerned this morning that you, as a believer in Christ, can do something to lose the Holy Spirit, let me just first encourage you, you can't lose the Spirit. Once you are united to Christ, the Holy Spirit is here to stay. And so if you're a Christian with the Spirit, the Spirit is not going to go away. But as we hear in the scriptures, you can sure grieve the Holy Spirit by your actions. That's Ephesians 4.30. You can sure quench the Spirit's work in your life. That's 1 Thessalonians 5.19. And so when you quench the Spirit or grieve the Spirit, what happens is that you lose the Spirit's empowering in your life. And that's what David's talking about here. He doesn't want to lose the Spirit's anointing and empowering in his life. David watched as the Spirit left Saul 
his predecessor in the kingship, and Saul had to endure years of trying to rule and be king without the power, without the equipping of God's Holy Spirit. Now, who would want that? It's a terrible fate to lose the equipping power and presence of the Holy Spirit. And so when you have sinned against God uh, and you experience guilt, don't just try to get over it. Don't just ignore it. Don't uh, hope that it goes away because guilt is destructive. And we're not just talking about guilt in the abstract, but we're talking about your personal guilt. This is your guilt that we're talking about. This psalm recounts David's personal fall into sin. And you probably know the narrative already, and in David's fall, headlong fall into sin, he broke at least three of the Ten Commandments, as well as numerous laws about what it meant for the king to uphold righteousness and justice in the community, and he agrees with God about all of it. Again, this is, uh, this is A, agree with God. God. Just listen to verses two through four. When David owns his sin, he says, my iniquity, my sin, my transgressions, my sin. Again, David doesn't cover anything up. He even wrote it in the preface of the psalm. And so everyone singing this psalm throughout history would know exactly what David is talking about. He owns all of it, every aspect of his sin. He agrees with God about all of his guilt, and we need to do the same thing. Now, it'll hurt as we look honestly at all of our sin, but that's the only way that we can get help. If I had refused to agree with my doctor, and if I were just to say, no, 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 I think there's not anything actually deeply wrong with my knee, and if I just kept living my life the way I had been, I actually would have made my condition way worse. And so we need to be aware of the ways that we're tempted to disagree with God about our sin. We are amazing about how defensive we can get about sin in our lives, about guilt when we see it, when someone points it out in our lives. We are very good at minimizing our sin And we can reject God's deeper analysis of our life. We don't want to admit that there's a deep problem within us. And so we'll say something like, okay, sure, maybe I did lose my temper once, but does that mean I really have a problem with anger? And we do that with all kinds of sins. We do that about lust or materialism or hatred or preferential treatment of others based on skin color or culture or class. We are afraid of God's deeper diagnosis. We don't want to admit that we have deep heart problems and, that, and, and we're afraid to own what that might mean about us. We don't want to admit that we are guilty but denying the problem only makes the problem worse. And so when you experience guilt, you need to agree about God with all of it. It is real, it is destructive, and it's yours. So when you feel that first pang of guilt, the first thing you need to do is agree with God. Agree with God about what he's telling you about your life. And it can be as simple as just saying, you're right. Oh Lord, you are right. But we can't just stay there. We can't simply agree with God and then walk away. We need to let that agreement sink deep down. After A is B. B, broken before God. And when you realize your guilt, you need to let it impact you. You need to allow it to to break you. Be broken. You can't read this psalm without hearing the anguish that David is in. He is clearly broken before the Lord. He's begging God to let me hear joy and gladness. He recognizes that he has a tremendous need for God to intervene. This isn't something that he can do on his own. He can't wash away his sins. He needs God to purge him, God to deliver him. He recognizes the death of his sin. Verse 5, behold, I was brought forth in iniquity. In sin did my mother conceive me. That's not blame shifting. He's showing the depths of his corruption. David recognizes that his sin goes down to his very marrow. 
He recognizes also that he has no excuse. Verse 6, you delight in truth in the inward being, and you teach me wisdom in the secret heart. In other words, you've taught me. You taught me what I should have done. I should have known better. So David doesn't simply agree with God's diagnosis. He lets it sink in. He is broken. But why does God want our brokenness? What does he gain from our brokenness? It's clear that God wants this kind of response. Verse 17, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. Oh God, you will not despise. God wants this. You could even say that God actually causes this response. Verse 8, let the bones that you have broken rejoice. And so why? Is God a prideful king who just wants to see his subjects grovel before him? Or is he a cruel judge who enjoys our pain? Why brokenness? Well, it's because brokenness allows us to depend on God. Before the fall, we were happy to depend on God. We were happy with the relationship that we had with him. We were pleased to call him Lord, Master, and Judge. But then pride came in, and we aspired to be gods ourselves. And this ruined everything. God wants to restore our relationship with him. He wants to be our God again, but this demands that we bow before him. That is the brokenness that God wants. It's not that he wants our pain. No, he wants our flourishing, but that requires our pride to break. Now, this puts us in a vulnerable spot, I think. Apologies are risky business, right? Anytime you say, I'm really sorry, you're putting yourself at the mercy of the other person that you're apologizing to, and so we understand that risk the vulnerability of being broken, and so we tend to protect ourselves a little bit. We hold ourselves back in our confession. We'll tell God that we're, we agree with part of what he's saying, but again, maybe for our self-protection, we won't go all the way. But David holds nothing back. He allows himself to be completely broken. How in the world can he risk such vulnerability? By trusting God's love. He trusts God's love. And when you trust that someone loves you, it is way easier to apologize. I remember early on in our marriage, I had done something wrong and I, had, I needed to go to Melinda and apologize. And at that moment, I was going to make my apology, but I was, I was recognizing that I was pretty nervous to apologize. And maybe you've had this happen before. It's scary to admit wrongdoing to somebody. And so I I apologized. I made my apology, and very quickly, Melinda said, I forgive you. I love you. And that was so reassuring to me, because when I knew that she loved me, I was even more able to be honest and to make my confession more freely. I knew that I was loved and accepted, even though I had messed up. And in this psalm, David trusts God's love. It's in the very first verse. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. According to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. David trusts God's steadfast, unswerving, never changing, covenant keeping love. David trusts God's mercy. And in verse 1, we hear in our English Bibles, we hear the word mercy twice. Have mercy on me according to your abundant mercy. But in the Hebrew, that's actually two different words that the English translates here as mercy. And so here's how my Bible dictionaries define those two words. The first word refers to, quote, a heartfelt response by someone who has something to give to one who has a need. That's the first kind of mercy. It's the kind of mercy or compassion that you feel when you've just gone to the grocery store and you're driving back home and you now see someone on the, on the street corner who has a need. You, the compassion wells up within you because you know that you have something that the other person needs and you want to help. That's the first word for mercy. God has that kind of mercy for us. And here's the second word. The second word refers to, quote, a deep 
love rooted in a natural bond. And so this is the compassion that wells up inside of you when a family member is in trouble. You know that you would do anything for that family member because you have an intimate bond with that other person, and God is abundant with that kind of mercy too. Isn't that a beautiful picture of God that comes out to us just from verse 1? A God who is so compassionate for us that it takes two different words for mercy to describe who he is. This is a God who sees our needs and is ready to come to our aid and a God who is overflowing for us uh, with love for us like the bond of a parent. David trusted this kind of love And so he could risk being broken. Derek Kidner puts it this way, for all of his unworthiness, David knows he still belongs. For all of his unworthiness, David knows he still belongs. And you do too. You belong with God. God will not despise the brokenhearted. He won't take your apology and sit on it, and make you wait on pins and needles as he kind of passive-aggressively gets at you for whatever it is that you did wrong. He won't punish you when you make your apology. He is rich in grace and mercy. His heart, again, is overflowing with loving parental care for you. So be broken, yes, but be broken before God, before this God, this God of steadfast love and abundant mercy. After we say, you're right, then we are safe to say, I am so sorry. I'm so, so sorry. And once we say, I'm sorry, then the next thing we need to do is trust that God will forgive us. And that brings us to C, cling to God's promises. We need to cling to God's promises. I've mentioned before that our family enjoys those extreme obstacle course TV shows. And uh, you've probably seen at least some of these or clips of them on YouTube. One of our favorites is one called Ultimate Beastmaster. Uh, And Ultimate Beastmaster is a tremendously challenging course as all of these world-class athletes compete to be the Ultimate Beastmaster. And on one of the exercises, the athletes have uh, have to climb through all these things and then they're standing on a platform and the platform tilts forward. So they're 30 feet in the air on this tilted platform and they have to spring out from the platform and grab onto a rope and swing over to the next obstacle. And so you better believe when they grab that rope, they cling on to it like their life depends on it. The only way forward is for them to cling to that rope. And when we are trusting in God's promises, we need to cling to them because everything depends on it. I don't know about you, but I've had this happen a lot. I will feel really guilty about something. I'll make an apology and the sense of guilt doesn't necessarily go away. The sense of guilt can kind of linger in our hearts. And so I'll say over and over again, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Uh, But I don't always immediately feel that sense of forgiveness or freedom. And we shouldn't forget that Satan, our great enemy, is the accuser. And he would love to continue to remind us of things that we have done wrong. And so how can we make it through these lingering feelings of guilt? Well, we need to cling to God's promises exactly the way that those athletes cling to that rope. That's how we're going to make it through. And David shows us that in the text. He clings to God's promises. David clings to the promise of restoration. He's very hopeful that God will restore him that the destruction of guilt will not have the final word in his life. He looks forward to experiencing forgiveness and receiving joy, and he anticipates praising God and leading others in the pathway toward salvation. And that's the second thing that he clings to. He clings to the promise for restoration personally, but then he also clings to the promise for revival. Revival. 
He wants his story to be a part of God's larger story of redemption. Like we sang earlier, sinners shall learn from me and return, O oh God, to thee. David hopes for revival. And we even see that as the psalm closes out. Verses 18 and 19 are this hope that God would preserve and restore the kingdom in Zion, that multiple burnt offerings of thanksgiving would rise up to him. God is, or David is hoping that God's kingdom would increase as more and more sinners turn to God. And as David clings to these promises, we hear through the psalm that his confidence increases. So the psalm that ended with a great heartbreaking cry for mercy ends with tremendous confidence and hope. The guilty person has found redemption and holds fast to it. Can we have that same hope? Absolutely. You can absolutely have that hope because David's hope points to our hope, Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ accomplishes everything that we need for salvation. If we mine this psalm for everything that David's hoping for, all of his hopes are grounded in Jesus Christ. Like verse 2, we might ask, will our sins be washed away? 1 John 1.7 says, the blood of Jesus... God's Son cleanses us from all sin. Jesus' sacrifice on the cross washes us clean. Or verse 14, will we be delivered from blood guilt? Romans 8, 1, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. God declares us, declares you, not guilty through Christ. Verse 10, will we get a new heart? 2 Corinthians 5, 17, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. God gives us new hearts through the resurrected Christ and through his spirit that he pours out upon us. What about verse 11? Are we cast out from God's presence because of our sin? Ephesians 2, 13, in Christ, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Jesus restores us to God's presence. Verses 18 and 19, will God build his kingdom? Ephesians 2, 10, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works. God builds his kingdom through forgiven sinners who have tasted grace and are now zealous for good works like we hear in the book of Titus. And that will include sharing their faith out of the joy of knowing Christ. So in Christ, you are freed from guilt and so cling to him and cling to these great wonderful promises of restoration and revival. They will carry you through guilt as you struggle for joy. And so if you're here this morning and you're feeling a sense of guilt because you know that you have done something wrong, Psalm 51 teaches you how to pray. Maybe you've never trusted in Christ before. Maybe throughout this sermon you felt this increasing burden of guilt as you hear me talk about sin and law and wrongdoing and, and guilt, and you, you realize that actually you do feel guilty. And maybe you've felt guilty for quite some time. You long for that weight to be removed, but you don't know how because nothing you've tried thus far has been able to remove that sense of guilt from you. Well, let me tell you, you cannot find guilt alleviation or guilt removal from the world. Our culture does not offer redemption. The Australian apologist Sam Chan describes the Western culture like this. He says, we've become an honor-shame culture without the hope of redemption. He says, we cancel people, but there is no forgiveness. People are too scared to say sorry because they won't find forgiveness or redemption. But, again, let me quote from him, the Christian story says that it's okay to not be okay. And Jesus accepts you for who you are, and there is forgiveness in this God. That is a wonderful, liberating message. And let me invite you this morning to believe it. If, you, if you've never trusted in Christ before, let me invite you now to believe in Jesus Christ. Trust that 
everything that I just read is true, that God loves you, that Jesus Christ accepts you and still loves you even though he knows your sin. And so trust that. Believe that. Tell God that you are sorry, that you are sorry, that you agree with him about your sin, and then experience the joy that comes from forgiveness. Be freed from your guilt and from your shame by trusting in Christ. And maybe you've been a Christian for a while, but even this morning you feel a renewed, deeper conviction of your sin in new and powerful ways. Listen to what God is telling you this morning. Repent of your sin. Repent of your sin and trust in Christ again. And then cling to those promises, those precious, precious promises for your salvation. Whenever Satan tries to drag you back into feelings of guilt, trust in Christ. Experience the joy of your salvation and then pray about how you can share it with others so that God's kingdom will grow. In the 1920s, Coca-Cola had a slogan. It said, it's the pause that refreshes. It's the pause that refreshes. Well, Psalm 51 offers us the prayer that refreshes. It starts with guilt, but it ends in renewal. And so when you've sinned, and when you experience the knowledge and the pangs of guilt, pray like this. A, B, C, agree with God. Be broken before this God of grace and cling to all of God's promises for your salvation. It's a simple prayer, but it will bring you from guilt into life. You're right. I am so sorry, and I trust you. Let's pray. Lord, we do confess freely that you are right about our sin. We are so sorry for our sin and we trust in you now. And I pray that through your spirit, you would help us to trust you even more. If there are any who have trusted in you for the first time today, I pray that you would grant them great joy in salvation. And if there are any who have been entrenched in sin and guilt, but have made a confession now, I pray that they uh, would experience joy and forgiveness and peace. Calm down our fiery consciences with the good news of the gospel and sustain us in that with gratitude so that we wouldn't want to sin in the future. Help us to trust you ever more in the coming week as we deal with the sense of guilt and our shame. Be with us through the Spirit to teach us that we are forgiven and that your heart is full of love for us. We pray all of this in the name of Christ. Amen.